Uh -huh. Hello and welcome um, back to Able to Learn Air. Sorry for technical difficulties, folks. Um, uh, my name is Lawrence Seiler, and welcome to my inaugural, inaugural program tonight. And we are here with uh, Kim McNicholas of Way to My Heart and the Global Pad Association, as well as Dawn Marie Hernandez, who is a powerful, powerful advocate um, in um, being a pad warrior for uh, Kim's group. Uh, welcome to Ableton On Air. Um, great to have you folks. Um, now, let's uh, talk to uh, Kim. Um, uh, welcome again to Able to Learn. Uh, Kim, can you tell me the missions and goals to the Global Pad Association? Well, for our mission, just in general, the high view is we're here to save life and limb through education, high touch advocacy, and real time support for a disease that is more prevalent and deadlier than most cancers combined. It's called peripheral artery disease, hence the Global PAD Association. It has blocked arteries in mainly the legs. Three in five people who suffer a heart attack have peripheral artery disease, but most don't know it, if at all, until it reaches advanced stages where heart attack, stroke, and or amputation are imminent. And our organization provides comprehensive education personalized education for those who are at risk of and who suffer from peripheral artery disease. We also provide high touch advocacy, meaning that we spend a lot of personalized time with our patients. We have more than 12,000 patients across the globe that we support. Me, we prepare 12. them for their appointments. Mm -hmm. We provide them with critical questions to ask their doctor. Mm -hmm. We support them during their appointments. We facilitate a productive and satisfying conversation between the patient and the physician. And then we follow up with the patient afterwards to have that conversation to ensure that they have a comprehensive understanding with what the doctor was talking about, what their orders are, what their diagnosis is, what their options are, especially when it comes to treatment, and what is their long-term strategy going forward? You know, how are they going to comply with their lifestyle modifications that are critical to improving their PAD? Diet, smoking cessation, diabetes is a huge risk factor, getting their glucose under control. And the number one thing that we really help with is walking. Walking is the best medicine. You can grow new vessels that will reroute blood flow with every step you take. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is to help improve the quality of life of our patients, including Dawn, who is here with us today as well. She is one who has reached out to us, and we've been doing our best to support her as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a, qu a question, Kim. Um, it, it was um, just something off the cuff. When, you, when we talk about blood flow and gang, gangrene and all of that, uh, neuropathy is one of those things that also where you can't feel anything in your limbs. Um, can you explain a little bit maybe about that as well and why it's important to have blood flow when it comes to um, this kind of thing? Right. So first off, you mentioned gangrene. And so gangrene usually typically follows there's like possibly you can get an infection and a wound. And one of the signs, so I think you're starting kind of starting out with the signs and symptoms for PAD. Um, you can end up in early stages with intermittent claudication. And that means when you walk, you get a cramp in your leg and you rest and it goes away textbook symptom but you may also have tingling you may also have numbness and you might also have what a doctor might describe as diabetic neuropathy or neuropathy that they claim may have come from sciatica in your in your back or some other reasons but when you 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 may not feel the typical cramping because you might also have the neuropathy, you might also have the numbness, and you may not even have any indication that you have PAD until you end up with a wound on your toe that will not heal, it becomes infected, and you say, I don't understand why it won't heal. Well, it won't heal because you don't have enough blood flow to bring the oxygen and critical nutrients for that healing to get there. You might also end up with gangrene where the tissue's just dying. And so that's why it's so critical that you do have this blood flow. And you're right. You may not have the textbook symptoms of 
claudication, the cramping in your leg because it might be masked by other things, especially neuropathy. Mm -hmm. uh, Don, uh, how did you become an amputee? Let's start there. Um, well, it, it goes back to when I was about 37 years old. I'm going to be 47 this year. Mm -hmm. I had a heart attack, a massive heart attack. Um, for a month and a half before that, I was having what they call a STEMI, which is like symptoms of there's something wrong with your heart. Sooner or later, you're going to have the massive one and then you're going to be gone. Um, I was helicopter lifted from one little hospital to a major hospital, placed in the cath lab. They placed one stent into my uh, major artery of my heart. Mm -hmm. About three years later, I had to go back. They placed two more stents. So currently I have three stents in my heart. About started about the end of 2020. I was having really cold feet and really, really bad cramps in my legs. I went to the doctor. He said, oh, the cold feet is just your anemic. Keep taking your iron. The cramps in your legs is you don't drink enough water. You know, increase your water intake. Well, about March 2021, I got a sore on my left foot, um, and it wasn't healing. It was getting worse. I went to the podiatrist. He said, oh, we have to send you to the hospital because antibiotics, nothing was working. Finally, they did um, the examination. They did a few testing, and they came back and said that I had peripheral artery disease. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, go at, ahead. Um, at that time is when I um, went in and had surgery. He told me I was 100% blocked. I couldn't even walk from the front door of my house to my car without cramping, um, severe cramping with with tears, tears in my eyes where I had to sit on the floor because that was the only way I could get my legs to release. So you, had, you had severe, I'm sorry for interrupting, you had severe cramps in your legs and you really, uh, so the only way for you to relieve those cramps was for you to sit on the floor? Yeah, and at, this, at that time, I'm a, I'm a mother, so I still have to go food shopping. And I would literally walk into Walmart grab the carriage to go grocery shopping and be in full-blown tears mm. before I could even start shopping. So then it got to a point I was pretty much putting myself in a wheelchair. Um, so I ended up having surgery at a small hospital here in Virginia. He cleared out my legs. They were great. For four months, I was running around like, like a nut. But all of a sudden, the cramping came back. I went back and saw him, and he said, I'm sorry, but the first operation failed. Your legs are now completely occluded again. So I went home, and I looked on Facebook, and that's how I found Kim and her organization. I um, worked with her. We found a surgeon back in Boston, because that's where I'm from, and I feel like that's you know a place where they have better care than Virginia. That's my opinion, though. So would, you, so would you agree that sometimes going to different states, if you can't find something in your state, going to another state would would be good in terms of finding uh, medical professionals, I guess, right? It is because some people live in rural areas and, and or live, live a distance that they're not near a major hospital where they can receive better care. I mean, it all depends on your insurance. Also, um, my insurance, luckily, I'm, I'm able to go wherever I want to receive care. Mm -hmm. but, now, um, now, is everything... Um, now, okay, so since you said that, in, in terms of everything that you just said, um, why is it important to go to a doctor? Because, you know, some people might be stubborn, and Kim, this goes to you also, some people might be stubborn in terms of not going to a doctor or not wanting to go to a doctor, but we kind of want to hammer it home of the importance of going to a doctor. How serious can PAD get where you kind of have to say, hey, I got to call an ambulance? Because that's exactly what happened uh, to my wife. You know, when my wife had gangrene, I had l a little less than 72 hours to get her to the hospital. Otherwise, she would have been... She would have been she would she would have passed away, but why are people stubborn when it comes to not wanting to go to a doctor? This goes to both of you. Well, see no evil, hear no evil until <laughs> evil strikes, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have right, patients. 
Don, you Don, but, Don, you're not going to believe this story. We had a patient over in Utrecht that actually came in with a garbage bag tied around her leg from the knee down. And the doctor says, um, what in the world is going on here? Why, why didn't Wait, you come here dressed, earlier? I, I apologize. Uh, I'm trying to understand you. She was dressed in a garbage bag? She, her leg was dressed in a garbage bag. She was wearing shorts. Mm -hmm. And she had a garbage bag wrapped around with rubber band tying at the top. And the doctor said, what in the world? What, what is going on? And she says, oh, it smells. I said, how long has this been smelling? Oh, for a few weeks now. And the garbage bag is the only thing that worked. What took you so long to get here? Oh, I didn't want to be a burden. Oh, <laughs> Seriously. And it wasn't until the daughter drove in and was like, I can't even get in the room. It smelled so bad. Mm. And she brought her to the hospital. <clears throat> And, and I agree with what you said. If you don't know about something, then you don't have to acknowledge it. And I think a lot of people are afraid that when they go to the doctor, oh, I'm going to go to the doctor, they're going to tell me bad news. And most people are afraid of, of the ones, the major ones that kill us. You know, oh, the doctor's going to tell us I have cancer. Oh, the doctor's going to tell you I have diabetes. Now what happens, it's acknowledged, you know you have it. So now you have to make changes. And that's right. putting in work. And some people don't want to have to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for you to just say, I'm fine. Nobody's told me there's anything wrong yet. Since you since you said that, and um, we kind of... We're, again, we're educating people here tonight, and you know this is a uh, parental discretion advised. By the way, uh, can uh, can you tell me a this? Can you tell me about your uh, husband, Don? You, you spoke to me off camera, and you had mentioned about your husband's situation, and unfortunately, he passed away. Um, do you want to talk a little bit? Uh, you know. I mean, we you can go talk into him. Yeah, go ahead. But I'd still like to talk about how I became an amputee because we haven't even we haven't even gotten there yet. Okay, go so, ahead. So, I mean, in 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 this conversation, doesn't just always go for amputations alone. It goes for anything that's happened traumatic in someone's life. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> December tenth is when I went in to have my surgery. I was promised that I was going to come out walking and dancing on december 10th i formed a blood clot after surgery so they came in and they said uh, can you move your feet can you feel us touching the bottom of your foot nope couldn't do anything my brain was telling my leg hey wiggle your toes swing your ankle around but my body physically couldn't do it december 11th they came in and they inserted a catheter directly into my leg so they could try to blow the blood clot it was called a thrombectomy mm -hmm. on december 11th that night maybe the beginning of december 12th i began to take a stroke from the clot in medicine so they had to pull back the clot in medicine because it was either going to be i was going to stroke out and die mm -hmm. or they had to figure out another way to save my life and get rid of this clot in my leg so maybe I could walk again. So on December 12th, they did they did a bypass and also a, a fasciotomy, which is I was laying in the bed and they came up to the bed and they had to relieve pressure. They said I might have compartment syndrome, which is after surgery, your body can swell and it can block off nerves it can block off arteries so that's what they were afraid of so they came over with a scalpel right there in the bed and they sliced open both sides of my leg hence the fact you would think oh how painful one i was on a lot of drugs at this point because i was really sick and two the leg had no failing it was not receiving adequate blood so i was not failing it on December 15th, they came and they told me, I'm sorry, but the blood clot is still there. Your leg is dying off. At this point, the bottom of my foot was black. It was now necrotic. After that point, we would have hit gangrene, but 
on December 15th, they came to me and they said, we have to amputate your leg. Mm. That's the only way we're going to save you. So they cut below my knee. I was a left below the knee amputee. On, let's see, December 17th, they came back to me and they said, hey, I am so sorry again, but your circulation is only good up to your kneecap. Oh, so wow. we have we have to cut the rest of your leg off, your, the rest of your knee off. You are now going to be a left above the knee amputee. Okay, great. I turned to the surgeon. I said, well, can't we wait till the morning? I'd like to think about it. And he turned to me with that face. And I already know that face because I've been in the medical field since I was little. My whole family is. And I knew that was a face of concern. And I said to him, well, if this was your leg, what would you do? And he said, honestly, I would tell the doctor to take my leg off at this point. He said, because the way my body, my leg was dying off and the speed it was dying off, the gases were going to travel and the gases I'm not, Kim will have to elaborate a little bit on that more, but gases travel up the leg and it kills off, I believe, the, t the good tissue. So, so uh, I apologize sure. for interrupting. Was that the only way to yeah. save your life? Yeah, at that point, it was going to be my life or my leg. So and that was the same situation for um, for Lawrence's wife as well. It was the same. Yeah, yeah. You were going to end up septic. Yeah, well, actually, uh, like... You know, like I said before, in terms of sepsis, you only have a matter of less than 72 hours before the person passes away. And so according to the hospital that we went to, they, they said, well, because sepsis can go to the brain, and then that would be it. So that was the only way to save her life as well, yeah. So, um, wow. So um, at, that, at that point, you know, I had to make a decision Yes, it was it was my decision. You know, nobody else could make that for me. Mm -hmm. And I turned to him and I said, you know what? I need you to go have something to eat because that's what you need to do as a surgeon. You need to eat before surgery. I need you to wash up and scrub in and I'll meet you down there. I said, because I'm not ready to go. I still have kids. I have a purpose. But that attitude definitely changed once I saw my body with no leg, mm -hmm. once I had to face those challenges of having no leg. Um, since you said that, to, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you and to, You know, to end that part there and tie in my husband, my husband was also a man with one leg. Mm -hmm. And I met amputation back when I had to take care of him that was, he passed away 14 years ago. He was in his late 30s. He was of the same age I was when I had my first heart attack. He was 37 years old. And he died of complications of diabetes. And, and it's funny that you ask why people don't go to the doctors or why they do not listen to the doctors. He was a prime example. And no matter what the doctor said to him, please don't drink regular soda. Please lay off the candy. He was a Hispanic man, so he loved his rice. So and lay also, back. He, he, he probably loved a lot of sugar. Uh, yeah, know. and the coffee in the morning. Yeah, just even even just the candy. He was he loved candy. And, so, and a lot of food these days, like, for example, I know a lot of um, people from Puerto Rican descent that put ketchup on rice ketchup contains sugar so uh, right yeah. a lot of a lot of things have sugar and a lot of carbohydrates break down to sugar mm -hmm. so we could go on a conversation on nutrition that's a whole that's a whole important factor in any any disease mm -hmm. so my husband never listened to the doctors he was 19 when i remember the doctor telling him if you don't change your ways you will either be dead or with one leg by the age of 37 and to kid you not lawrence the man had one leg and died at the age of 37 okay because the doctor could tell and the doctor was an older gentleman that's been in the practice for years, he already knew what diabetes does to the body. But my husband did not want to listen. He wanted to listen when he was on full-blown dialysis. 
when he could no longer walk because his feet were being eaten away by the lack of the lack of circulation. I watched his toes disintegrate off his body. I watched them tr- take his leg off. I watched parts of that man's body self-amputate in my hand. Mind you, it was the man genitalia. His ben- male genitalia amputated into my hand in a piece of gauze because that man, before he died, had so bad of circulation up to his breast, like his breastbone level, right where his nipple line was, you could see a difference in the coloration of his body. God rest his soul because he was a Puerto Rican man and he was tanned, tanned and, you know, had color to his skin. When he died, the man was black, almost purple on the bottom of him. But like I said, when he wanted to listen, it was already too late. The, the disease had eaten him from the inside out. The damage was already done. Irreversible. Irreversible. There's sort of yes. nothing you can do. No. No, it what ends not. up happening is, is your, your, your vessels harden. I, I've actually been in procedures where literally the arteries were like bone. Why yeah, not that, that you are, but his hand went down. He had, a, he had his middle finger went down to literally skeleton. His, it got calcification, they said. His, his skin became calcified, mm-hmm. and it would just flake right off of his body if you touched it. So when you washed him, you had to be very careful because his, his skin, was, nothing was getting anything it needed anymore to keep him alive. His body was shutting down from the toes all the way up including every organ that it can to preserve your heart. That's what your body does. And that is exactly what he did. If we could share pictures, I would show pictures of what this man's body looks like. And anybody with diabetes would shape up very quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kim, wow. Yeah, I can tap in on that. And, yeah, and, uh, and can you tap in on it? But I also would like you to tap in because I know you, I know your time is uh, is very important. Um, h- how important? Because you had asked me to um, to get my wife's CT scans and all this. Um, why is it so important to keep up, especially when you advocate? Why is it so important to keep up with um, getting the tests and, and being on? Uh, and being on top of these things, because, I mean, doctors are great, but sometimes you have to stay on top of things to make sure that things go smooth. Or at least, you yeah, know. you need it to go smooth. You can't let anything fall through, go through the cracks, fall through the cracks, because, you know, it's a progressive disease, and it's only going to get worse and worse and worse if something's not done, and, and your physicians, your entire healthcare team are not on top of it. And if you're not advocating for yourself, which is critical why you need to have all of that, the your own uh, scans and data in your hands. Because I was mentioning, um, you know, alongside Dawn, that with her husband, she was describing the hardening of the arteries. The reason you can actually see the arteries a lot of times under the fluoroscopy, they pump in the contrast fluid, and even without that usually lights up, the arteries so that they can see them under the x-ray mm-hmm. but if they're if they they don't um even have the contrast fluid in a lot of times with these patients that are long-time diabetics uncontrolled diabetics especially smokers former smokers you can see what we call the calcium trail so why is it the bones show up under x-rays to show a break it's because there's calcium in there so imagine you have calcium in your arteries your arteries are going to light up without pumping in the contrast fluid. Mm -hmm. They can see what they call the calcium trail. And we've had patients where I've been in there and not even a wire. They'll take a wire and they'll they'll thread it into your artery and try and navigate through with that wire. And so many patients, the entire artery is just completely calcified and hardened due to that plaque, due to those sugar molecules or other environmental issues or other things that you're doing to yourself, including nicotine, 
damaging the artery walls, right? And with the da damage to the artery walls, all of this cholesterol and, and fats, all that, it, the LDLs, the bad cholesterol, they, they eke into the, the vessel wall mm -hmm. and they push that wall up and the whole artery becomes hardened mm -hmm. and blocks. And it just keeps creeping all the way up your body. And so, you know, you want to get scans from your doctor to show them the first one that is usually frontline diagnosis is the ABI, the ankle brachial index, blood pressure cuffs on your arms, blood pressure cuffs on your legs, and they measured the different pressures, right? The second one is the ultrasound, the leg artery ultrasound. A lot of times that they think you have a blood clot in your veins or what they call deep vein thrombosis or a DVT, for example, if you fly, that's when you could possibly get a DVT as well, or if you're in bed laying down a lot, which is why, Lawrence, it's really important for you to constantly be on that with your wife. If she's doing a lot of sitting, laying down, especially being a diabetic, mm -hmm. is make sure that she's always checked for DVTs. But needless to say, you want the leg artery ultrasound versus the leg venous ultrasound, which is more for DVTs. Mm -hmm. And then you have the CT angiogram, and that's where they also pump contrast fluid into your vessels to light them up, and they can really visualize those arteries. And you want to, when you go in there, to tell them that you are signing in to wait for your time to have these tests done, you need to say, I want a copy of these results on a CD. I want the images on a CD before I leave. If I can't have them then, what is the process by which I can actually get a copy of these? You need to have these in your hand so you can shop around and get second, even third opinions. Yeah, we had a patient yeah, that was in a hospital getting ready for open heart surgery and there was uh, somebody who hacked into their computer system and knocked it down. The doctor came in and said, you know what, we are, we can't do this. We can't do the procedure. We don't have any of your CDs or anything else. I mean, we don't, all our systems are down. And he said, actually, I have my test right here on my CD. And they said, what? Wait a minute, we could still do this procedure if we could just take a look at this. And because he had it on a CD, even sitting in the hospital, he has his folder he takes with him everywhere. Because he had that, he was able to have the procedure done right then and there. So I can't try home the importance enough for you to make sure to get copies of everything, hard copies of everything. And can I, fit, you go know, ahead, buzz in for a minute? Um, yeah. With that point, too, like she said, always shop around because some of these smaller, small hospitals cannot do more invasive procedures. And like with my... Sometimes, with my situation, I, I apologize for the choice. Sometimes you need to get second, third, or maybe even fourth or fifth. Uh, right, because is, some of these yeah. smaller area hospitals, the only thing they can do when they get to a cer certain point is amputation. And me being an amputee and your wife being an amputee, it, it's not an easy job. It's doable, but it is not an easy job. It takes work, and it, it, it's, it's forever with you. It's work for the rest of your life. You know, you, you, you deal with depression. You deal with how you look. You deal with relationships. You deal with problems with the equipment, learning how to walk. You deal with clothes not fitting you because of equipment. Mm -hmm. There's different ways that you have to learn to live life. Mm -hmm. But life is doable as an amputee, but that is not your first rope. You always shop around because there's always someone that's willing and caring to risk every piece of knowledge they have to save your limb or your life. And that, to me, is something you should shop around for. Um, since you said that, um, uh, Dawn, what is some advice that you can give caregivers, you know, because I'm dealing with my wife, but, you know, people that are caring for people that don't know their stuff and are scared, what is some advice you can give caregivers regarding um, either your situation or PAD itself? Um, uh, go ahead. All around being a caregiver for anybody, it, it, it takes you to be patient. 
you do have to have a lot of patience because it's it's not hard for anybody that's going through anything. Um, and as a caregiver, even as a professional caregiver, and I'm very strong upon what I'm going to say, and I will fight for this. And I don't like when caregivers say this or use this as a comparison. You're going to, don't worry, we're going to amputate your leg. They told me you will walk in six months to a year. Lauren, I, I have not walked. It's going on almost three years. That is another story for itself. But I don't like when you're compared to other people. Well, so-and-so is up and walking. Why aren't you? Everybody is their own person. Everybody is shaped differently. These prosthetic legs are very heavy. Um, some of us don't have athletic bodies. Some of us, like myself, still have another diseased leg that I have to manage and learn to keep and walk on that still cramps, still cramps to this day when I walk. Mm -hmm. However, like Kim said, walking has increased my ability to walk with my only leg that is left. Walking is the only thing that can help someone with pad before you have to go to some kind of in intervention. Walking is what builds collaterals. I myself have not walked in three years, but I can tell you by being in my wheelchair and still being a mother of three kids, running a household, food shopping, and everything I do, because I'm very active lifestyle. Do you, do you I have work? built I'm collaterals. Sorry. I have built collaterals in my wheelchair by still using my leg that is there. I take that leg like a crab and I crab it into the ground and I pull myself in the wheelchair. I don't just use my arms, I use my leg. My leg is always moving as if I can't stay still because if it's moving, it's receiving blood flow to the toes and it's pushing its way to build the collaterals. Do you work so at all or you or no? No, I do not work. I am um, disabled. I was. I have a, an associate's degree in the operating room as a surgical tech, but I cannot stand to keep sterility, so I cannot work. Mm -hmm. Kim, do you want to um, um, kind of piggyback on what she said about the importance of just uh, keep, you know, keeping going uh, despite all this? Because you know, this is um, hard for some people you know our listeners to deal with right now but um how um do you want to piggyback on some of this like you know, yeah yeah i mean it i think that she, one of her most important points that she made in in that is every single person presents with peripheral artery disease and even diabetes differently mm -hmm. um for example you know with with your wife not every diabetic ends up with an amputation um one in three diabetics over the age of 50 has peripheral artery disease. They have circulation issues, um, but they might not be to the extent of, you know, for example, Don's husband. So everyone presents differently. So it's really important, again, to reiterate, not to compare yourself to anyone else out there. And you have to understand the parameters by which you operate in life. Mm -hmm. And you need to push your limits, not that of someone else. You need to push your limits. We talked about walking as being the best medicine earlier. And everyone walks at a different pace. For you, for me, for Dawn, a brisk walk means something completely different. But for you and how you would define a brisk walk, you got to walk briskly to push through a certain amount of pain in order for, the, for those collaterals to grow. But your pain threshold, my pain threshold, Dawn's pain threshold, and even Arlene's are completely different. So you have to do what's best for you, so, but you got to do it. In uh, order to persevere with PAD, mm -hmm. this is a disease that will take over your whole body if you do nothing. So you got to push yourself. Lawrence, you've got to encourage your your wife to get out there and and push herself, push her limits, test her limits, and you know expand 
her abilities because that's the only way to not let this disease just take over. You've got to push. And, and just to, to piggyback on that, you know, the disease doesn't change the person you are. It's, it's what you let it do to your own mind. Every single thing, like with my amputation, to me, it, it, it's a mind game. Like, I have to train my mind to know that it doesn't have a leg. And then one day, um, it's hot and I'm, I'm aggravated because I have to stand up and try to get dressed and I'm falling over. And, you know, like, I'm frustrated. It, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just... Is there a way that, I'm sorry for interrupting, is there a way that you deal with the frustration better? Yeah, I mean, every day is a different day. It's always going to be a battle. I'm not this strong, like, I didn't just have my leg taken off and said, hey, look how strong she is. It's taken me three years to get to this point where I'm at. Do I cry? Almost every day. Because I'm frustrated. You know how much easier life would be with a leg? It sure would be. But I still have to live my life. So I, I choose to live my life. So I have to learn different ways to do it. There are ways to do everything. It's just, it's trial and error. And safety is always your first, first concern is safety. You never do anything that you feel like you're going to hurt yourself. Because believe me, I get on the floor and I crawl around. If that's the safest way to, for me to get something done, that's how I do it. If I have to clean my bathroom, I'm sitting on my bathroom floor trying to lean on one leg to scrub something. Mm-hmm. I stand up, I do the dishes on one leg. I've learned to balance. But it, it takes the will and, and the want inside you mm-hmm. to want to do it. However, the first key to any of this recovery is the acceptance of what is happening to you. You can't change what is happening. You can only learn different ways to either improve it or live your life to the fullest with what you have. It's uh, like a card game. This is your card. These are the cards that you would dealt for this card game. Are you going to just throw in the hand and say, screw it, life's over, sit around and rot away? Because I can tell you right now, you're only going to get put into depression even more. And your body's going to get physically sick and you're going to end up get sicker and sicker and sicker. And then more things are going to happen to you. Or you can find different ways to cope, counseling, family members, find a hobby, something you want to live for. Like even being able to go outside and on a beautiful day and look up at the sky and be able to see the beautiful colors that we have, the birds going by, whatever it is that you wake up every day for, other than God woke me up the next day to breathe, you need to find something. And that only comes from acceptance. You have to accept what has happened to you. Um, and, you, and, and I know there's one more thing you wanted to elaborate is on the burnout. Yeah. Do we all get burnt out? We all do. Somebody with a disease or an illness gets burnt out. And someone as a caregiver gets burnt out. I've been on both ends. Both ends. Do I wish I could bring my husband back and apologize? Because I was one of those E-I-T-C-H's all the time. Yeah, he was up all night. I had a baby up all day. I wasn't getting any sleep because I loved everybody in my house and I had to take care of them. Was I cranky? Sure, I was. But as a caregiver, sometimes we can't forget that we have to take the time out for ourselves. You have to sit back and you have to, you know, take a minute away from it. What Whether it's going to take a walk, go in the other room, whatever it may be, you do have to always remember to take time out for yourself. Uh, Kim, do you want to elaborate on, on you know, take taking the time, you know, to take care of yourself before you get burned out. Is there anything you want to add to that? Well, I I mean, I'd have to lead by example. (laughs) I don't. And, you know, the best advice I ever got was you can't give 100% of yourself unless you're 100% whole yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's really important to to take care of yourself both physically and mentally and take the time for you Mm -hmm. so that you can give 
to others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not only from a caregiver's perspective, but also even from the patient's perspective, some of these patients, you know, with PAD work so hard to persevere and it causes stress, it causes anxiety, they're pushing through severe pain, they're up half the night. I mean, it's a lot. And they need to be kind to themselves. They need to just allow themselves those moments to say, I'm doing the best I can. I'm taking a deep breath right now. I'm gonna get there, but I don't have to get there all the way right in this moment. They, they so even, the best thing is to be kind to yourself yeah, along the journey. In terms of burnout, they even have a exam, another example, the oxygen mask on the airplane. Uh, you know the you know the thing where the the stewardesses turn around and, and give you the oxygen mask. You need to um, take care of yourself before you take care of somebody else. I mean, it, it's just you know that's just another example of you know getting oxygen. But um, Kim, is there any other story or short story that you can tell of patients that? Um, you've had problems with, but then turned around and persevered? Wow, we had right? nearly a thousand that were all on deck for amputation and we were able to, to save their limbs. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone we've been able to save their limbs, but in turn, we've also been able to, even if we can't save the limb, we've been able to save their life um, through our, our, our support. Um, we just had a patient, gosh, she's in Florida, and wow, we've had a really rough year because she was told that she needed her leg amputated, mm -hmm. and that wasn't okay for her. Didn't want her leg amputated. And so she, this, this one week, God, we had her in three different emergency rooms, even one of the emergency rooms, she had an 11 hour wait, and we had to um, get an Instacart with a blanket, a lawn mat, and some snacks and a pillow and a blanket so that she could lay out outside of the emergency room and be comfortable because they didn't have a bed for her. And she couldn't sit up because she had an abdominal um, a artery her aorta was blocked and her iliac arteries were blocked in her abdomen mm -hmm. and so um it, it took a lot with that but she was able to persevere she kept a good attitude a lot of humor through that but we were finally able to get her into a doctor and we were able to get the right procedure someone with advanced skills 90 percent of these doctors do not have advanced skills to open up arteries in a minimally invasive way what do you so mean, that's why what we do always you mean say advanced? get a second and third opinion. Uh, I'm sorry. What do you mean? I apologize for interrupting. What do you mean by advanced skills in this case? In a minimally invasive way that they're able to use wires and balloons in the smallest arteries of the calf and into the foot. Most doctors will tell you it can't be done. It shouldn't be done. Walk, walk, walk. And when you can't walk anymore and you're in too much pain, we'll just amputate. Time to get a second opinion and meet a doctor who is trained in those advanced tools and techniques when deemed medically appropriate. Mm -hmm. And it also includes a doctor when they go in to treat your and open up your leg arteries, they will do a little poke in the groin area and send in wires and balloons and roto rooting devices and stents and they'll come down from the top. But if they get stuck, and the blockage is too much coming down from the top, the more advanced doctor will actually poke in the foot or poke in the calf and come up from below just in case the blockage is a little easier to make more headway coming up from the bottom. Oh, wow. Um, and also, didn't you, well, you mentioned off camera, I don't know if you have time to mention this one last story, but you, you mentioned to me that there was a patient that you had that the doctor sent him home with no money and no um, prosthetic leg or if. Oh yeah, that was in Louisiana that the, they, they cut off his leg and sent him home. His entire refrigerator was empty and he called me and he said, Ken, what do I do now? 
They didn't have a social worker. They had nothing for him. So at the very least, we were able to go on Amazon. We ordered him a leg scooter because he had a baloney amputation. So he it was easier for, for him um, to be able to get around um, with a knee scooter. And we were also able to fill his refrigerator with ready-made meals that were healthy so that he could get by until the, the nurse came by the next day. Well, this has been uh, an invigorating. Uh... Not, not to cut you off, but before Kim gets off, I think she should share. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Go where, um, you know, anybody caregivers or anybody seeking information mm -hmm. can go on, um, and they also have a leg saver hotline. So yes, uh, can you American guys country. can you guys give that um, information? And then, uh, Dawn, I want to ask you about your future goals and things. But oh. go ahead. Yes. Sure, it's padhelp.org, padhelp.org, and the Leg Saver Hotline is 415-320-7138, 415-320-7138, but if you go to padhelp.org, you, you'll find all of that information on the website. We also have Facebook groups at padsupportgroup.org. So that's padsupportgroup.org. Dot org. And also padhelp.org is our main website. Okay. So okay. It's, it's no longer it's no longer way to my heart, correct? We are the way to my heart. You can still reach out to the website at thewaytomyheart.org. That is our 501c3, but we filed to do business as it's called a DBA, the Global PAD Association. Okay, and can you repeat the number one more time, please? 415. Three two zero seven one three eight. Okay, four one, uh, four one five. Three, Thank you two. so much for having me on. Okay, thank you, Kim, for um, joining me on Able to Learn. And um, Don, um, one last uh, question for you: What is your um, future goals that you have, um, being a, a su such a powerful advocate? Um, my. I believe that the, my purpose of losing my leg was to help other people um, get through what they're going through. Um, right after I lost my leg, my cousin's girlfriend got in a major car accident and had to receive an amputation. She lost her foot, um, which caused her to become a below the knee amputee. And it helped me with my own recovery by being able to be there for her at any hour. Um, because, you know, when you first go through stuff, you can't sleep at night. You, your mind's going crazy. You don't want to pe wake up some people. Some people don't understand. And, and, and I don't say it's because they're not understanding. Sometimes it's at a point, if you're not, if you have never gone through it, you can't really sympathize with someone as well as somebody that's going through it themselves. So at that time, I opened my phone for her. She was able to call me at any time she wanted to. Um, throughout this whole time, we now have a friendship. Uh, she's no longer my cousin's girlfriend, but we have a long life friendship. She still calls me. She asks me, you know, questions. I helped her through how to take a shower when she got home, how to get up the stairs like different ways how to learn to balance to wash her dishes right after um she lost her leg my cousin that did live with her um i never did get to mention i lost my leg also with this blood clot because i have an unknown blood clotting disorder that came out of nowhere we don't know where it came from it exacerbated the day of surgery when I went to clear my arteries in Boston. They still don't know why. They've done every test in the world and they cannot figure out why. So I'm on a, um, I'm on Coumadin, which is a very uh, strong blood clotting disorder medicine. It keeps my blood very thin and I have to self-test every week and call it in and they have to regulate it on a daily basis um, for dosing and I have to watch like a special diet. But um, what is, uh, I'm so, sorry for interrupting. What is, go ahead. The, what is the special diet for people that are on? Uh, I mean, you mentioned the blood thinner. Um, which is so limited. you know, I don't know if it's for all all of them. I know with mine, um, I have to watch greens 
because it knocks it knocks the medicine's effectiveness out. So if I was to sit down and eat spinach all the time and kale and collard greens, I have to watch because it's not going to let my medicine work, which is going to make my blood very very thick, which could cause me to form a blood clot. To this day, I have not, thank God, um, the medicine's been effective for me, but they do have to change it every week. They increase it, they decrease it. And it also depends on like how much I drink, how much water and how much, how fast I'm flushing it out of my system. But my, so coming from that there, my cousin um, also has this unknown blood clotting disorder, just like me. Um, but he's in worse condition. He's in his 20s. Mm -hmm. And Kim's organization actually helped him get from get communication because he was living in Kansas. Mm -hmm. And in Kansas, they were um, giving up on care on him. They yeah, were I, just wanna, I just want to add that you mentioned communication. It's, it, when you have a medical condition, um, it's extremely important for those that live in rural areas to have uh, appropriate communication, a phone, computer, that kind of thing. Because if you can't get, it, you need to dial nine one one some way, you know. And in, in, in order, I don't care if it's WhatsApp or Facebook. Um, if you can't get in touch with the person, and you know, you don't want the person to die in their house. No, but I think most places do have where if you did plug in a phone to a landline, I think you still can call 911. But I mean, that, that's a choice, I think, when it comes down to the person and it comes down to what they have wrong with them. Like me, I myself, I get my care in, Ma in Massachusetts. My daughter is, uh, she takes seizures. She has a seizure disorder. So me, preferably, I don't move to areas that are not near mm -hmm. the major hospital. You see, so I mean, not everybody can do that. I mean, not everybody, yeah, has that access. Mm -hmm. But yeah, everybody should have some form. I believe everybody pretty much has some form of communication, whether it be computer, telephone, or or some way, mm -hmm. I would hope. Okay. Right. Is there anything else you would like to add before we end? The only thing I can say is... Um, you know, Kim's organization is a great organization. They've helped many, many people, um, and they continue to help you because, like I said, it is it's it is a mind game. It does come back all the time. It does haunt you like a nightmare. Um, and sometimes, you know, you just need somebody to talk to. There, there's many of us that are, like, willing, that are a part of this organization that are willing to give anybody support whether it like i said whether it's a text message hey how you doing today or you want to call and you want to complain about how bad your day has been you know you want to vent what whatever there there's so many supportive people that have come together with the same disease you know trying to help help each other there's never anything to be embarrassed about because i'm sure that what you're going through we have all gone through and not like she said none of us not all of us are amputees but some of us are so we're able to help in all different ways whether it's dealing with pad you know with two legs dealing with pad with one leg dealing with pad now you have no legs mm. now you have bad arms you know you've got you know blockages in your heart you know you, you still look for some kind of support and i've always felt welcomed and i've always felt that they've been a great great group to have behind us and they're great advocates because i'm very very strong at always getting a second opinion mm -hmm. my amputation wasn't because of the lack of care my amputation was due to this blood clotting disorder in my body so use that leg save hotline you know if you have a family member loved one anybody you know yourself that are in a situation you want to try to get a second opinion, they can give you all the resources you need. Um, if they don't have it, they will definitely research it for you and try to find your best possible option. And the padhelp.org also has a bunch of great information. And the Facebook page, there's a bunch of us all on there. We, there's a um, Facebook support 
walking support group. I myself will put, you know, pictures up there of me walking with my prosthetic leg, trying, you know, to take it one step at a time because that's all it takes is just one extra step each day to try to build those collaterals in your legs to fight the pad. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Able to Run Air Live, and um, we hope to. Ha I hope to have you again. You have you are a powerful, powerful advocate in this fight, and um, this you know, despite everything you've gone through, um, we, you know, I thank you again for joining me on Able to Run Air uh, tonight, and um, continue to uh, do what you need to do to be a powerful advocate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And like I said, if anybody ever needs any support, you can look me up on Facebook, Don Marie Hernandez, and I'm also an advocate for the uh, Kim's organization. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us on Able to On Air. And for more information on the PAD Help Support Group, you can go to www.padhelpsupport.com. Dot org. That's P A D help support dot org. And also, um, also you can go to the way to my heart dot org, www the way to my heart dot org. And their leg saver hotline is 1 415 325 7138. That number, once again, is 1 415 um three two five seven one three eight again and their website is padhelp.org padhelpsupport.org and the way to my heart dot org and the number one more time is one four one five three two five seven one three eight and I would like to thank you for joining me on this edition of Able Den on Air Live and the next show which is next month we're gonna be talking about the um the um, Power Olympics, which is happening on August 28th. Thank you so much for joining me on Abled and On Air Live.